This is Be Being Human. I'm Richard Atherton, Dr. Ingeborg Bosch, writer, speaker, therapist, vegan. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, well, maybe let's start there because before we did this interview, I asked you to fill in a form and asked a bit about yourself and discovered you're a vegan. I mean, I I'm a kind of a lapsed vegan. I did it for a while really strictly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I've slipped a little bit. But are you your full time vegan? Well, actually, um, yes, it's well, some of, I must say cheese is the big thing, you know, the cheese, because if I go out to a restaurant, especially here in France, it's even to get vegetarian dishes is really hard. But mm. vegan is almost impossible. So when I'm out, then, you know, I will compromise sometimes. But I'm very much aware of the suffering that is connected to uh, dairy products. So actually, the suffering, you could say, in a way that is attached to dairy products is almost worse than the suffering that's connected to, to meat products. Mm. So in that sense, you know, the, the cheese looks innocent. It's like, oh, well, it's not an animal or anything. But actually, there is really a lot of uh, stuff to it. And I, I, I talk about this in my fourth book, P.R.I. Mastering the, th the Three Steps to Conscious Living. Mm. I remember, I was really, when I was writing this, I was really, you know, like getting inspired. And then my brothers said, hey, look, you know, we can't do this. Either you write a whole book about the veganism and all of that stuff, all the animal suffering, or, you know, you make it just into a little passage. And I had to compromise. Because I understood, you know, their uh, argument, because it's not a book about veganism. And of course, uh, so, you know, it's another subject, but it's very important. It's really very important to me. And, uh, well, here, I'm, I'm, I have so much to say about it, because at the same time, you know, I don't want people to feel judged, people that uh, do eat meat or, you know, dairy products, because most, most people, of course, do. And it's very important for me that people understand it's not a dogma. It's not like, okay, well, you have to do this or you can't do that. But it's more like I would like to give people the information so that they become aware of actually what they are eating and what that does mean. And then not to feel guilty about it, but to be able to be informed and make a choice. And if you don't feel ready to make the choice for whatever reason, you know, most people say, oh, yeah, but I like the taste so much or, you know, it's my social environment. Don't feel guilty about it because that's just another that's just another defense. That's not going to make this world or your life into a better place anyway. So just do whatever you feel comfortable with. That's, right. that's I would really like to stress it because after my book, well, you know, after I wrote about this, people would say to me, "Oh my God, now we we can't eat meat and we can't do this and we can't." And I said, "No, no, no. It's not like that. It's not at all like that. Just do whatever feels good for you." I just want to give you the information because not many people have, you know, this information, especially about dairy products. It's, it's quite um, unknown, strangely enough. Even with vegetarians, they, they're not really aware, I think, of how the dairy products are made. Mm. Mm. Given me pause for thought because, I, yeah, I sometimes tell myself, oh, well, I'm not that bad. I, you know, I'm mainly vegetarian, but... Yeah, you're, so, you're right. Maybe the, the dairy animals have it worse than the... Yes, and, and also, you know, in order to get dairy, uh, the animal, the mother, whatever, it's a cow or a goat or whatever, they have to have a, a new baby every year. And this little baby then has to be slaughtered because we take the milk that was there for the, for the calf. So actually, you know, cheese and milk can only be there because of the dead animals. The dead baby, baby animals. I'm not correcting which. You understand? So it's, it's yeah. Like, I hadn't even realized that that they so they have to keep them in the cycle of pregnancy to keep the milk flowing. Yeah. Exactly, and they have to after a few days. They or in most, you know, the most extreme, the longest period that the little animal can stay with the mother is six months. But you know, like in bigger. How do you call it? Firms where they really have the industrial production. There, it's just like you know, they're born and they're really taken away, and they're just transported, and they're either you know, how do you call it? They're, they they get a lot of food, so the little calf becomes really fat, and then they're slaughtered or they're killed immediately. I mean, it's very cruel, and the it's it's a horrible. I mean, if you imagine that the, your your milk and your cheese is coming from from this, you know, it's. Uh, yeah, but I have to admit, you know, I mean, I I love cheese. I love cheese, 
So I, I do eat it. It's really hard to get, you know, the consciousness and the reality and, and the behavior all uh, lined up. All lined up. But at least to know so that then you can choose. And if you choose to eat it anyway, then it's, it's okay also. I, don't, I think we should not be, you know, too judgmental on not on each other and not on ourselves. Hmm. You get the defense, like it's just another defense. So that's, I suppose that's my introduction to your, what I think of Ingeborg Bosch, I think defenses, right? So I think uh, that, so perhaps let's unpack that a bit. And so, yeah, what, what, what do you mean by defense? What, what's that about for people, the uninitiated? Yeah, well, I think that the, 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 the essence of what I'm trying, um, the information I'm trying to give to as many people that as possible that want to hear it is that um, due to you know being a small vulnerable child which we all were one day you know even if you have the most loving person uh, pe- uh, parents you are still a small vulnerable child in the beginning a small baby completely dependent on its parents you can't move out you can't tell your parents that they should do it differently um, you have no time perspective so we are in the beginning very vulnerable and very dependent, completely dependent. And this causes for a situation in which we uh, will have experiences that are too painful to process because also our capacities emotionally and cognitively are not yet developed. So we experience things like we're crying alone in our crib, for example, which is happened to almost everybody. And baby can't make any sense out of it. Can't say, oh, this will be over in 10 minutes. Or my mother's just busy. She knows me a lot. No, for the baby, it's just overwhelmed in in stress hormones. It's a very stressful experience for a small baby. And so these experiences that we all carry inside of ourselves, which we have not been able to process, they have to be repressed. And this repression is, of a, has, is really vital because if the child would not be able to repress these experiences, it would actually, it could be life-threatening. They be, could be overwhelmed by the vastness of, of the feelings that, that are generated by it being so dependent and completely lost and not being able to interpret and understand the situation. So this repression then has to be safeguarded you could say, by what I call defenses. And there are five different defenses, which are uh, cognitive, emotional, physical ways of actually thinking that um, the, what's happening with us is about the present. I mean, as, actually, that's maybe the most important thing. We think that our emotional state, our emotional problems are about the present. Instead of seeing that these emotional problems very often are a layer of defenses, which actually is there so that these old um, repressed early uh, life experiences stay repressed and stay unconscious. And it's the defenses that keep those down. Is that how exactly. to think about it? It's like we're programmed. It's like we're programmed like our automatic unconsciously. We are programmed continually to keep these old experiences repressed. And this mechanism works through the five defenses. Mm. And, it, and, you, and it's right, you, you refer to that, that, you refer to two consciousnesses. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the, the, the consciousness that we keep down, you call that our child consciousness. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's the collection the of, of all the repressed memories, experiences that were too painful for us to process when we were so small. Right. But, and that could also be just memories or experiences that we've had maybe as adults, but we also have to repress. So it's, it's mainly childhood, but it could it also be like, a, you know, some horrific... Usually it's not, usually it's not about... Um, Usually, it's it's really experiences that we have had before we were three years old. Okay. During, you know, the the prenatal period is very important. Then we have birth; it's a very important moment, and then we have the first year, and then the first three years. I mean, that's really the the, the period in which our brain is still very much developing, and everything that happens to us, especially stressful experiences, are like imprinted on this, you know, little soft uh, clay material almost you could say and it just stays imprinted 
And after three years old, there are certain parts of the brain that are finished, and then uh, the whole the processing starts uh, to change. It's the hippocampus, which is done when we are about three years old, which is a very important part in our brain, which helps to connect a narrative content to an emotional experience. For example, my father hit me, I was very afraid, but he did that because, or whatever. You know, there's a story connected to the emotion. Whereas before we are three years old, we do have the emotional memories. So the fear of being hit, the pain of being hit, the sadness of being hit, but we cannot connect a story to it. And this is what makes for like what I say, sort of like these <laughs> like flying saucers in our, in our brain that are like grenades, you know, they're very sharp. And once these emotional memories that are not connected to a narrative context, once these are awakened because of things that happen in the present, which I call symbols, and mm -hmm. which can be almost anything that you perceive in the present that has unconsciously an exact resemblance to something that you depressed as a child, then the whole system is activated and the defenses come into play. This is maybe a little bit abstract what I'm saying. Just tell, please tell me if it's... <laughs> no, it makes complete sense to me because, you know, I've spent you know, many years in therapy and, and what you're saying about it mainly being before three years old really resonates. So I've done a lot of work going right back to my birth and I had a very difficult mm -hmm. birth. I almost died. I was pulled out with forceps. Mm -hmm. And if I was to put a quotient on how much of the pain I have from my early life, mm. maybe 80% of it is my birth experience. Mm. So mm. that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. 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 And would you, would you say that, that mm. symbols, is that, I mean, often people describe triggers. Is that another word? Is that the same idea, do you think? You know, something yeah. in the present? That... Yeah. I prefer the word symbol because it's more precise. Because a trigger, you know, anything can trigger. Whereas the symbol, the word itself already... Um, shows that it's the symbol that's the present day whatever is happening situation or person is symbolic reflects huh? the symbol is a direct reflection mm. of something that happened in the past so that's why mm. I put the word uh, symbol but it actually means the same as what usually is called a trigger okay but for you it has, yeah okay I see what you're saying it's, it's symbolic of something that happened yeah. back then and that's why it's more accurate mm. word right? yeah Okay. Okay. And these defenses, so you, so you, you've enumerated, right? Specific defenses and throughout your books. And that's what I've found, you know, really helpful in terms of identifying mm. how I messed up. Mm. <laughs> how you survived, you mean, Richard? How I survived, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We also, I always say, be, you know, be thankful to your defenses because they helped you survive. We're here because we have these defenses. They're fantastic, really. Hmm. Of course, then when we get older, they sort of start missing up our lives. Yeah. And you talk about how they can be slightly different for men and for women. Different yeah. defenses for men than for, for women? Or at least men tend to, to have patterns that are more associated with certain defenses and vice versa for, for, for women. Is that true? Well, it's always dangerous, you know, to generalize and... Uh, you know, but of course, you know, you can see certain tendencies, like men will tend more towards, you know, shutting down emotionally and maybe becoming uh, more easily uh, violent than women. And women in general would maybe tend more to being pleasing and uh, start doubting themselves uh, and be fearful. But at the same time, you know, the way it's shown on the outside might be different, but underneath, I think uh, women also have a lot of uh, tendency to become aggressive, but they might show it in a different way. Mm. Or, you know, and they might also shut down emotionally, but they might show it in a different way than, you know, the man, typical man with the, the newspaper. Well, nowadays, I think it's the iPad <laughs> behind the breakfast table. You know, a woman might do it differently. She might be, uh, you know, on the phone the whole day with a friend or she might be uh, working on, on some project she has, but shut down nevertheless. So the outside might look differently, but the, 
behind and outside, I think, the same mechanisms apply to all of us. It's right. really universal human nature, I think. Yes. Mm. In any culture, anywhere, you will see these five defenses operating. Would yeah. you like to go through them shortly? Yeah, I think it's useful for the audience, you know, because they may identify in themselves something that, that, that resonates for them, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the defenses are... Uh, structured into like what I what I would say is a wall of defenses, and th this wall has different layers. Now the first layer will be what I call the fear defense, and the fear defense is any situation you know it's activated. The fear defense is activated if you are feeling afraid in a situation without it being physically dangerous. So, for example, something a lot of people can relate to is the fear of speaking in public. Now, a lot of people will say, yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm anxious, I feel afraid to speak in, in front of a large audience. But if you look at the situation, I mean, it's not physically dangerous normally. I mean, you're not going to, you know, they're not going to do you any harm. So that's a situation in which actually something is happening which is unconsciously touching upon old repressed pain connected to early stress from the, you know, the very first beginning of our lives and instead of you know feeling that stress and knowing what it's really connected to the defense in this case of fear is automatically activated so that's like the first layer and then on top of that fear defense is what i call the primary defense which is everything that has to do with the idea that something's not good about us, you know, like either it's all my fault or I'm not good enough, I will, I will never be good enough or I'm, I'm too stupid or I'm too young or I'm too old or I'm too whatever, you know, something's wrong with me. So that's the next layer. And this layer protects very well from feeling any old pain because instead of looking at what's happening to you, you'll be feeling that it's all your fault. So the small child can survive with the primary defense. We all know, I think many people will know these stories about how children always blame themselves for whatever happens to them. Mm. So the child gets hit, the child will say, yeah, well, but I was naughty. Or, or even the child that is abused, you know, they, they will think that they did something wrong. Or if the parents divorce, many children think it's their fault. Now, this is an example of an automatic, you know, the, the defense is automatically activated in order not to feel the pain which is actually touched upon by the present. So you understand it's the, the present day situation actually is touching something that is very old and repressed. In order not to feel that thing, the, act, the, the defenses, the, the wall of defenses is activated. So then you have, so that's the primary defense. Then on top of the primary defense, there's the false hope and false power, which are two sides of the same coin, you could say. The false hope defense is the defense in which you're, you know, trying to please other people, always trying to do your best, being a perfectionist, you know, never being able to just sit down and relax, always busy, always something to do. And the idea that we, the idea, the illusion behind false hope is if only I would do this or if only I would be this, then, you know, my needs would get met. Mm. So, but of course, this can never happen because it's a defense. It's an illusion. So you will just keep on going on and on and on. It's like a hamster in a wheel. It's very tiring and actually can lead to burnout if you just keep going with that. And, and can it also I, project that onto a partner, your, your, your false hope that somebody will change? Oh, yes. That's the, the other side of the same coin. That's what I call the false power defense. And that's where you think if only she or he would change, then everything will be okay. So, you know, then you're blaming the other person that is actually that person who is, you know, in whatever way, not, not what you need or what you want. And then the last layer of defenses is what I call denial of needs. And this is like the highest uh, layer of defense. And it's a defense that's very much appreciated in our society because when you're in denial of needs, it's actually as if, you know, everything's fine. Don't worry, be happy. You know, the keep calm and carry on. It's a very popular slogan in, in the UK. <laughs> Well, that's right. It's the typical, typical denial of needs. Like, yeah. what do you mean, problem? No, there's no problem. Everything's fine. 
And this, this defense is, you can recognize it by, on the one hand, you know, it looks like everything's okay. But underneath, it's sort of like gray. It's like life is the same every day. There's no ups and downs. There's no passion. There's no uh, very little intimacy, little um, capacity to really connect to others. So it's like a, it's like a big cover up, you know, that is just numbing is in a way it's a, it's it's very much a numbed out state of, of living and uh, unfortunately a lot of people are in it and it's very much appreciated in our society and children are very much raised you know shut up and uh, don't cry don't be a cry baby doesn't matter you know be strong yeah all that sort of stuff helps them to just get out of all emotional states and go into this uh sort of robot state of denial of needs. Right. Yeah, and I think the Brit, if we did some national indices and surveying of, I, I could imagine the Brits would be high on <laughs> denial of needs. I mean, the stiff Arthur, upper lip, the stiff upper lip. That's the stiff the upper lip, yeah. So, yeah. so Arthur Janov, who I know is, you know, we may come on to, but uh, yeah. he, he, he talks <laughs> about people being pathologically English. Which I, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's really uh, yeah. It's an interesting way to say it, and um, yeah, it's a cult. It's a cultural state, you know. I mean, every country has their own sort of defense structures. Are interesting to look at. Yeah, and I know, and I'd seen somewhere you'd written making an, uh, an association between the different defense strategies and different religions. Yeah. And how denial of needs is maybe you could think of like, uh, like Buddhism could be an example of. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah, a lot a of manifestation yeah. of a denial of needs. A lot of spirituality, actually, you know, not only Buddhism but a lot of spiritual paths can can. It's of course it's not their purpose, but they can be misused in order to strengthen your denial of needs. Like everything's fine, you know, you feel bad and then you meditate and uh, you say everything's empty and then you feel fine. Again. So that's not addressing your emotional problem, really. That's interesting, but but I know you meditate. So how does yeah, yeah how does that work? Ooh. Well, for me, meditation is, is really important, and I, I think it's a fantastic tool if you use it to connect to your uh, state, to your emotional state. Or so if you use it to breathe away any emotions, then I, I would say, well, be careful what you're doing. But if you use it to feel what, what's going on, if you actually use it to connect to yourself, and then maybe to go beyond that connection once you're feeling okay, then um, meditation can actually help to do also this sort of emotional work. It can help very much because it helps you to focus and feel what's going on inside my body. Mm, okay. So that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, again, referencing Arthur Genov, he, he would refuse to take people who were into transcendental meditation. Right? That, that would be like a no-no. If, if he saw that on the form, he was like, I'm not taking you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's a certain type of... Yes. Arguably, from this perspective, a misuse of meditation. Yeah. So there's all different kinds of meditation, and I would, I, I think I'm, I'm a lot less strict than uh, than Janov because I would say someone who is doing meditation out of you know a, a strong denial, need of denial. Let's say he's doing these mantras all day long because you know he just wants to numb out everything. That means that this person is carrying a lot of old pain, and actually, in me, it would inspire a lot of compassion. And I would say, right. if, he, if they are ready to do this personal work, fantastic. You know, I, I would maybe put them first on the list because I say, wow, that's a major, that's a major step. Yeah. Because a lot of people that are into spirituality, they sort of look down on personal work. They have a tendency to look down and like, oh yeah, psychology, emotions. Oh yeah, well, I'm. You know, I've, that's behind me. I'm, I'm on a different level now. So if these people are actually saying, no, I'm not on a different level now, I need to address actually everything that's been repressed inside of me because it's not gone. It's determining my life to a large extent. I think that's fantastic. Right. Yeah. So I'm not very strict. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about Arthur Genov because he's one of the the figures that we have in in common. So I've done a yeah. lot of work in primal mm -hmm. therapy, 
uh, Arthur Janov wrote the book Primal Scream in the 70s, and I know you reference him in your latest book, mm -hmm. Illusion. So, yeah, for the benefit of the audience, would you like to talk a bit about who Janov was and how he's influenced your work? Yeah, well, I think um, it's funny because I, I remember that my parents actually bought the book in the 70s. So I remember the book that was on the <laughs> in the bookcase. It was my father who was a pilot, and I think he found the book somewhere anyway. And then they asked me, I was 18, and they asked me, so Ingrid, do you have any childhood traumas? <laughs> I remember this very well because obviously they had just read the book and I said, no, I don't have any traumas, nothing, nothing. Well, I found out later, of course, that I, like anybody, in spite of what they did and what they didn't do, that I carried trauma also inside. At that time, of course, I was too young. I was not aware of all of this. So that's how I first, uh, you know, heard about Arthur Janoff, um, which was in the yeah, late 70s, beginning of the, eight, of the 80s. And then he came, actually came back on my path when I started um, reading the books of, Ar of Gene Jensen and started working with Gene Jensen because Gene Jensen is an American psychotherapist uh, who is now retired. I think she's now about 83, 80, 84 almost. Yeah, 84. Um, and she was uh, trained by him. She actually was living in Minnesota and then she read Janoff's book and... Um, She's a little bit younger than he, but it's sort of like the same generation. And she actually moved to California to do uh, the training there, the primal training. And then she went on from the training that she had with Janoff, and she developed her sort of, yeah, you know, she took it to whatever you want to say, next level, or she added some concepts to it, made it more into a more cognitive, not just feeling, but more cognitive work also included in the therapy. And then she wrote a book, um, Reclaiming Your Life, and that was in the 90s. And this was, this was a book that I read when I went into a burnout. And then I read this book and I thought, my God, this is fantastic. So then, you know, that's where the whole thing actually started. I wrote to a Dutch publisher. I said, you've got to translate this book. It's worth gold. It's fantastic. And then he said, okay, we'll do that. But would you like to help us with the promotion? I said, yeah, sure. I'd love to do that. And then um, I met Jean because we organized the workshop and the publisher asked her to come to Holland. And um, so then we started working together. And then she told me about her experiences with Janoff and, and what she had learned from him, uh, which was mainly the regression techniques, I think. That was the most important thing that she learned from Janoff. And that's then what she taught me. And then from there, you know, combined with what I had already been doing and my own ideas and thinking through the concepts that I learned from her, from their PRI development. So you could say that uh, PRI is, is, is it's like the grand, uh, <laughs> Janoff's grandchild. <laughs> okay. That, yeah, that's really good. So, I don't know if he would agree. He's looking down on us now. Maybe he would say, oh, I don't want that French on. But maybe, uh, yeah. There's a direct, so you can say there's a direct descendancy. Okay. So there's a couple of things to dive into there. So so regression. So I think a lot of people, when they hear regression, they're like, oh, what, you mean past life regression? You know, were mm -hmm. you a soldier in World War One or something? Yeah, so cool. so what, do we, what, do we, what do you mean by regression? Technology? Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah, and that's, a, that's a very important point. Um... What I mean by regression is like, you know, a technique you can also compare to hip hypnosis um, in which you actually take the person back, you help them to access their unconscious mind, their unconscious, their amygdala, the emotional memories that I just talked about, which do not are not connected to a narrative context. So, you know, I can have a narrative context like, oh, when I was six we moved to another town and then I went to another school and then I had a really mean teacher and there were kids, there were, you know, well, whatever. There's a whole story. But that's not the difficult stuff. The difficult stuff which has been repressed is all these emotional memories which are just feelings that are not connected to anything. And in the regression, you will help the person to actually access these um, experiences that are connected to very strong emotions and then to find out actually what they are about. So it's, 
it's incredible actually because it's like you you open up a reservoir of experiences that have been repressed that have been recorded that have been stored in our our brain in our mind but had, that have never been accessed but nevertheless are governing governing our daily lives for like 95% of the time you know yeah. this thanks to Bruce Lipton amongst others you know this knowledge is really getting out to the general public that 95% of what we do think and feel comes from this unconscious programming, which Bruce then links to the first seven years. And, you know, that could be very true, but I think the most important is the first, is the pregnancy and the prenatal and the first three years. But anyway, it's the early, early experiences that we've all had. So this is what regression is about. And it's really important um, in order to understand what, what is this, this huge reservoir, 95, imagine 95% of what I'm doing, thinking and feeling is coming from a source that I am not aware of. That's mind-blowing for people, I'm it's sure. It's mind-blowing. And even more mind-blowing is that I'm not aware that I'm not aware of it. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, you know? Uh, yeah, the famous Donald, Donald Rumsfeld quote. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Because we, live, we live as if we know, I know why I'm doing this, I know why I'm doing that, but actually we don't, but we don't even know that we don't know. Mm. No. Mm. We are starting, and this is fantastic. I think this is so great, and I really am thankful to Bruce Lipton because he's done so much valuable work in this domain to make it known to a large public that actually 95% of our you know, emotions, thoughts, and feelings come from this unconscious source. And so this, we want to make this unconscious source conscious, and that's what regression is the major tool to do this. Mm. And that's certainly my experience of the, 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 using these regression techniques. And Janov again talked about this in in, in his, his book, The Architecture of Beliefs. And he talks about the fact that regression drives our beliefs, our whole beliefs, not regression, our, this, un, this, this reservoir of, of yeah. subconscious feelings drives our entire belief systems. And I find that every time I'll do some, some more deep work on myself, I'm like, oh, bang goes another belief that I've held for 40 years. Yeah, exactly. It's extraordinary that the, the depths of yeah. of this, in terms of what a hold it has on us, on our personalities, and all aspects yeah. of our, ourselves. It's mind blowing, actually, how we are directed by a source that we have no idea of, but which is decipherable, and that's the good mm. news. I mean, we can decipher it. It's like a very exact exact code we can decipher, and then it all becomes so clear. It's am and it's amazing, and it's so fantastic because it. Oh my God! You know, it just it can set you free to such a large extent. I mean, I don't want to say that I worked through all my stuff, not at all. But I used to have so many fears. My God, I was afraid of almost everything, and now I look how I live my life, and it's just you know. <laughs> It's like there's hardly any fear left. It's, it's, it's astonishing. It's really astonishing. Yeah, I've had that experience exactly the same. You know? mm. All areas of my life where I had fear, I had fear around relationships, I had fears around sex, I had fears around mm. public speaking. You know, it's just like boom, boom, yeah. boom. And yeah. it's, it's like super hard work, and, and we yeah. could talk about that, but it's, mm. it's, ex yeah, it's extraordinary, the level of transformation that can be achieved by tapping yes. or the the level of transformation I've achieved by tapping tapping into this. Yeah, and this is what you know. This, this is what you just you wish this for everybody. I mean, that's why I just work so hard because sometimes I think, oh my god, you know, I just I don't want to stop, stop. You know, I don't want to do so much stuff anymore. But me and and all the you know the team that we were the pr pretty big team in Holland now about 60, 70 people and it's growing. Um. It's just because you know it's mind blowing. Once you once you discover how the mind is put together, how it works, and how you are influenced by it without knowing it, and how destructive it is for everything that you do, for your relationships, for your health, for you know you're creating or living your potential, creating the life that you want to live. Once you discover this, and once you discover that there is an answer and that it is possible to change it, then you just want to pass this on to as many people as possible. 
So that's why I'm so happy to do this podcast with you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Then. Big, big mission. I mean, I just want to get this out into the world. That's that's what I'm here for in this lifetime, at least. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's awesome. And and I'm the same. If if one person watches this and uh, and gets yeah. from it, then it's then it's worth it. And I think humans have had an intuition about this for for for, for centuries, perhaps. But we've 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 labelled it as demons that are driving us or. Mm. Um, you know, all these metaphors that, that, that I think speak of this intuition or the wolves in the basement, you know, is another metaphor that resonated with me early in terms of thinking about this stuff. We, we, we kind of understand that we're driven by these, this, these other forces we can't quite grasp. Exactly. And it's interesting that they're actually accessible, that they are, and they're within. They're not out there, they're within. It just, it takes this enormous courage to, to face them. and. And then certainly in my experience, very skilled therapists, um, mm-hmm. or really I could, you, we could think of them as just sort of specialised facilitators of a process that allows you to, mm. that has allowed me to, to go there. Mm. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I would like to add, because I see that a lot of people that are hesitant to actually start doing the work, and it's because they are afraid of, you know, oh, my God, what's going to happen? And uh, it's going to be so painful. It's like fear is holding them back. And what I would really like to get across is don't be afraid because, you know, it's so much less, how, how should I say, less worse? That's not good English. <laughs> it's, it's so much less horrible than you think. And what really is horrible is to live your whole life in these defenses. I mean, it's, 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 it's a prison. And if you don't do the work, you know, then your life will just keep going on and you will be stuck in these defenses. And that's really what I think is much more courageous in a way. It's more courageous to lead a life in defenses because it's a very painful life. Whereas if you do this work, I personally never thought it was that painful. You know, I, I experienced, I, I remember a few experiences or maybe really one where I thought, oh my God, I'm going to die. If I go any further, I'm going to die. And then I called Jean and I was so happy to, to have her on the line exactly be- in between two sessions. And then she said to me, well, maybe it is too hard for you. Maybe you can't do it. And that was just the right thing. <laughs> and then I could just go, I thought, oh no, it's, I can't, you know, I'm there almost. So I should do it. That was about the, the, the biggest, uh, horrible, most horrible experience I had because, you know, as long as you know that what you're feeling is coming, is like the old programming that's coming out of your cell. I always see it as that all the cells in your body are programmed with whatever was happening in the first few years. And so in your regression, you open up these little cells and the content comes out. And as long as you know that it's not happening now, And as long as there's someone, you know, if you have help from someone and they know it's not happening now, you can look at it, you know, you don't go into the whole, into the experience as if it's happening now, because you are still aware that you're in 2000, whatever. And, uh, you know, you look around and you think, no, I'm I'm fine. I'm safe. I'm not going to die. And then you can go and go through the experience and look at, look at, it's more like, for me, it's more like, Letting your body do the work and then you are sort of like observing it, you're researching it, you're looking at how it's feeling, knowing, realize, oh my god, this so this is how it was, and this is what I would have felt when I was so small if the you know life saving process of repression and denial would not have been at work, and then you understand I could have never survived. I would have felt that at the time being so small and it happening there and then. But feeling it now, I don't know, maybe for you it's different, Richard. Please tell me. But I I, I never thought it was really that horrible. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had really, yeah, experiences. Cause, because a lot of mine's, my work has been going right back to the birth experience and this this yeah. place of being very close to death and then mm. the choking and the foaming of the mouth and the and the writhing around it's yeah it's it's yeah, yeah i i just found it very unpleasant to put it in an english mm. way and 
and yeah, really, really difficult. And and, and I remember being quite resentful at, at Genov, who would say, "Oh well, all my par- you know, my patients talk about it being oh well, people talk about primal therapy or regression as mm. being being patient as being painful." But my my patients always tell me that having been through one of these experiences, they feel relief. And I just thought, "F you, Genov, I <laughs> never feel relief. I just feel." Mm. You know, like I've just been through, you know, the ringer, and um, and I just found it virtually all of it excruciating. Mm. And what kept me going was all of these these extraordinary benefits in my life. And it, it'd be mm. like, oh, that that compulsion's just gone. Mm. Oh, that just mm. got easier. Or you know, it's just like this kind of magic yeah. process where, and it, people are going to listen to this and think, wait, you know, yeah. is it? Yeah. What's yeah. it on? But it really mm. is. It is like this mm. this sort of extraordinary secret. Mm. process yeah. that has your whole life improve in yeah. ways you can't imagine before yeah. you go into it it's like a, 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 alchemy alchemy the alchemy yeah that's a good word yeah it's alchemy yeah and and yeah. how about for you then what was your f- what, when was the first time you you dived into this this reservoir what for well, the first time when i did regressions yeah yeah like and, and the lead up to that and how you ended mm-hmm. up taking the first step you know talk talk us through that yeah. well Actually, I um, it was through it was by accident. Of course, there's no accident, but there was by accident. Uh, and I write about this also in my first book, Rediscovering the True Self. I was in a therapy client-centered uh, therapy, and the therapist was going on vacation for four weeks. And so I, that was a big symbol for me. You know, that was touching on my pain and fear of abandonment, which I didn't know at the time. I just realized that I got sort of like irritated with her. So here you see the defense. I said, why don't you go away for four weeks? It's a long vacation, isn't it? I mean, they said, yeah, well, I need the break. I said, yeah, the four weeks. So anyway, so there I now looking back and I see that it was touching all pain and I was into a false power defense. And then when the session was over, I went out. I She uh, accompanied me to the, or she, she walked with me to the door. She let me out of her house. And my car was parked right there and was sitting in my car and she was standing in her door and she waved at me and then I waved back. And then she turned around and I will never forget this image. I looked at her, I saw her back and then I saw her elbow because she was wearing like a short sleeves uh, t-shirt or something and I saw her elbow. And I was just fixated on this elbow and then I started to drive and I just was overwhelmed by this incredible, incredible sadness. And I started to cry and cry and cry. And I, I could still drive. I could still drive. So I was on the highway driving home. And I thought, I got to keep on driving because something very special is happening. And I know if I go home and my husband's there, then it will be gone. So I just kept driving, driving and crying and crying and crying. And then later, you know, I realized here, you know, something, you know, that it was the exact uh, that's so interesting, the exact sensory perception. So I saw her elbow, and this was the exact remembrance, re- resemblance of something that I, you know, had lived through as a child, which then later I uh, could actually trace back to my parents uh, going on vacation when I was very small and, and leaving, and I could see my mother, you know, I could see it was the same image. I could see her turning her back walking away while I was, you know, with my aunt. And I could, you know, it's the height of the shoulder, I think, the small child I was. I was just looking, I was completely fixated on, on, that, uh, on that angle. So that was the first introduction to, sort of like accidental introduction to regression. And then, of course, uh, when I met Jean Jensen and we started doing work together, then she started to you know, teach regression and then she helped me to do regressions. Then I had experiences like you, but not that hard, actually. Mm. No, maybe it's different because I didn't go back to birth, you know, and also, I mean, I had a very, very difficult birth, also horrible birth, and very much of the trauma in my life, or the difficult things in my life, go back to that birth experience where I was stuck, and I, you know, I couldn't get out, and my mother was panicking, and so she started, you know, like in her panic, I think she started hitting on on her belly, right. and she was put under, anest- she was anesthetized. Yeah, 
she doesn't remember all of this, but I can I can feel it in regressions where I'm like I'm stuck, and instead of being helped, I'm being attacked, and then I can feel like I'm dying because it's you know the narcosis which is coming also towards me. So these are very yeah these are very deep imprints, very very deep imprints that then you know will translate into many things in the rest of your life. Yeah, so... Yeah. I, it, I mean, I suppose the bottom line is we both had the same outcome. <laughs> <laughs> Our experience of the process may have been different, but I, I suppose our experience of the, the regression element of it may be different. Yes. It, well, I, I think maybe PRI being the, the grand, say, the grandchild of primal therapy... I think it's uh, we work more cognitively. We work more with the observation. You know, what is the sensory perception? What do you perceive in the present? And then we take that down into the old uh, repressed uh, memories. And then we come back into the present and we download the information from the present. So I think the process, of course, I mean, it is, you know, this, I think it's the same bloodline. But I think it's a little bit less... Uh, feeling state, feeling work, and it's more cognitive and behavioral. I think what I've heard from Jean Jensen, you know, like she told me how they would lie on mattresses and they would be screaming and yelling. And I mean, that in, in PRI, we, we don't do it that way. It's, it is a little bit less, um, well, I don't know what the word would be, but it's different in that sense. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's less feeling based. And- yeah, and yeah, I've not experienced both to know yeah. the, eff- the relative efficacy of the two approaches. Yeah. I think you're right. It's the same. It's the same blood line. It's the same idea. Go back. Go back. Feel the stuff you couldn't feel. Exactly. Heal all the stuff you couldn't heal. Yeah. And, and your life gets better. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. you you used a, a word there was a key word in in this set of ideas. So imprint. Explain for people what, what does that mean. What do you What's your understanding? What I mean by the imprint is like I, I really see the image of the small brain of the baby and the small child being so malleable because it's still forming. And so it's like fresh clay, you know, and so any any experience, any print on it will be stuck in there because it's so soft. It takes in every experience. Uh, has a lasting uh, effect. So if a small child is experiencing, uh, is frequently experiencing stress, stress, early stress, then it, it will have a, a permanent, it will leave a permanent imprint in, uh, in the organism, in the person. And this will translate later on, it will translate into all different behaviors, uh, emotions, um, thoughts, that then translate into all different kinds of uh, diseases, whether they're mental, emotional diseases or physical diseases. You know, I, I, I think you might have heard of uh, Gabor Maté, who's become very popular these days. And, uh, you know, he, he used to be a physician. He's a retired physician. And he said, if there's one thing I've learned from all the work that I did in the, in the clinic where I worked, is that every illness, be it mental, emotional or physical, has a direct link to early stress. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's really clear about it. So I'm, I'm really happy also to collaborate with him because he's getting the message out there. He's really making it very clear. He's a very convincing talker also. So it's really good. Yeah. Can you give an example of an imprint that, that you learned of about your own organism? Yeah. Well, for example, being stuck. You know, I was literally stuck in in, in birth. So um, so this this translates into many things. It translates into claustrophobia. You know, like the fear of if I go into a tunnel and I can't see the end of the tunnel. If I would see the end of the tunnel, it would be okay. But if I couldn't see the end of the tunnel, then oh, you know, immediately I'd be overwhelmed by just this physical reaction of strong fear, very horrible. I mean, I could say there is no danger, but my body would just be in a complete state of fear. So that's an example. But it would also translate into 
uh, being stuck, in, you know, more like in an emotional sense, like speaking in public was one of my huge fears. I mean, I would rather die than speak in front of more than two people or even one. <laughs> I mean, really, I really had very, very strong fear of speaking in public. And um, that also had to do with being stuck because if you're there, you know, and then they're looking at you and then you have to deliver whatever you want to talk about. You're sort of stuck, you know. You can't just say, well, sorry, I don't feel so good now. I'm, I'm going to leave. See you later. <laughs> so that's another way in which this imprint of being stuck could translate. But also, I remember an incident a few years ago where I was in the... I live in France, and in France they have, uh, I think, the, I don't know what it is, but they make sort of like parking areas in which they have very high... Um, how do you call that? The... The sides where you know you can't drive over. Uh, bollards, yeah. The what? Bollards, we say. Bollards. 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 I I, I can't understand that for me. So you can't just you know drive out. I mean you have to. It's almost like a labyrinth sort of thing. Okay. And I remember one time I was driving around and I just couldn't find where was the exit. And I re I remember I started to enter into some state of ridiculous um what should i call it panic you know or not not panic but like hysteria like starting to swear and get really upset and really angry and i was almost ready to just drive over one of these things <laughs> i mean ridiculous you know it took me maybe 10 minutes because it was very big and you know everywhere i came there was another like barrier i couldn't get through so imagine, you know, one imprint and how it translates into, you know, like the claustrophobia is sort of like you can understand. But the, the, the fear of speaking in public and feeling like you're stuck there is already, you know, that's a different level. But then also like, you know, getting out of the parking area, whatever. And I'm sure there's other situations that it would translate into where it's about being stuck. And I, I just can't. You know, I got to get out. I have to get out and I'm not getting any help. Nobody's helping me. Quite the contrary. I feel that any moment I might be attacked. And then the next step is I'm going to die because, you know, then it's the narcosis that's setting in and I just lose consciousness. So this is a huge influence. It's yeah. quite a dramatic one, actually. I don't know. For me, it's sort of like, well, yeah, that's how it is. I don't know how it is. You know, for people that are not <laughs> that are not familiar with this kind of work, what they're well, a lot of people say to me, like, "Yeah, come on, can you really remember your birth? Give mm -hmm. me a break." Mm -hmm. And so, one of the distinctions I like is this idea between extrinsic memory and intrinsic memory. Yeah, and I say to people, "Well, it, I may not have an extrinsic memory of birth, and by that I mean images and, as you say, yeah. a narrative yeah. and words and so on. But it's yeah. possible to have an intrinsic memory at a cellular yeah. level, like the body still remembers. Absolutely, and that I have crystal clear memory of yeah. those moments before birth, and yeah, and um, it's stored. Everything is stored, and this is this is incredible. The intrinsic memory. We, I mean, it is like a tape recorder or video recorder. It just records everything that happens. It's all there somewhere. Hmm. And we can access it. We can. And the body will, the body will start doing what it did in, in the original situation. Hmm. Yeah, I've got, they, they tape me in some of the, the primal sessions and that there are videos of me kind of, yeah. salamander movements and, yeah. and that's how I first get, that's how I first believed in this was that I'd read uh, the biology of birth one of Jenons and, like, mm. books and, and, and was reading about regression and so on and then uh, I'd always had this thing where I'd kind of make these funny sort of ticks and I'd be like Kuh. you know that would happen to me a bit and, you know, mm. and, I, and I was in the gym once and for whatever reason this had come up and I was doing my clicking chicken -y thing and I thought, okay, I'm just going to go with this. You know, maybe mm -hmm. there's something in this. And I'd been reading the book at the time and went up to this empty gym area, right, exercise area, or maybe they did the Pilates or something in there. Mm -hmm. And I just let myself go with this, this tick. And I was on the floor. I was writhing around, my phone coming out of my mouth, and, mm -hmm. and I was sweating. And, <laughs> like, someone came in and put their hand at the door and they... <laughs> 
They see me on the floor. <laughs> what are you doing? And I'm like, okay, all right, now I'm leaving. It's okay. And <laughs> and and that hit me. I was like, there is no way that was auto suggested, right? I'm not that good an actor. I couldn't. And, and the physical stuff with the, the raising exactly. temperature, but I, I could not have made that up, right? That's not no. me, no. kind of. You know, Richard, what I always say to clients also when they say, well, maybe I'm making it all up, I said, I don't think so because your body, you know, how could you make this up? But another thing, even if you could, even if you could make it up, you wouldn't want to make this up. I mean, who wants to make this up? I mean, it's not, it's not the kind of, you know, memories that you want to go down memory lane with, <laughs> right? You don't. Exactly. So, and, and you can, once you're in it, you feel it's not coming out of the mind, it's coming out of the body, and it's very, very convincing. Because I had the same, you know, thing. I, I remember I used to think, oh, yeah, regression, okay, back to the beginning, first year, okay. But before birth, come on, you know, this, come on, you know. I, I just felt like, no, I don't believe that. That can't be true. That's too far-fetched for me until I had it myself the first time. And then I knew because it wasn't me doing it. It was my body doing it. And I was just watching my body, actually. And then I knew, my God, you know, everything is still there. And then, of course, with clients, I see it happening. And that's why it's so important as a therapist when you do this work, you know, you can only go as far with your clients as you have been with yourself. But it's all there. It's, I've even had regressions. And this might be far out for some people, but I've worked with clients on regressions in which they actually were there uh, you know, consciously before their they could watch their own conception. I don't know if you, I mean I haven't experienced that, but uh, I I I could see the process. You know, they, they, it was just like they could see the the sperm and the eggs and it coming together and being sucked into it and feeling what they were coming, what kind of a dimension they were coming from and where they were going. You know, it was. Very, very strong experience. I remember one guy who had this happen who was completely uh, anti religious, atheist, anti spiritual, and he knew, you know, that I'm, I, spirituality to me is very important. He knew that. So he came out of this regression and he said, You know, I really don't want to tell you this, but what I saw was actually that I came from this dimension where, it, you know, the colors were beautiful and it was so warm and it felt so connected and I went into this like dark energy like you know knowing my god you know I have to go somewhere where I really don't want to go but there's because there's so much pain and so much sorrow waiting for me and it changed his life and I remember it, it was so impressive to me because it's not someone who would want to imagine that you know he, he, he would have rather wanted to imagine that that was nonsense so it's, it's it's completely incredible, fascinating, beautiful. Spiritual, so that's yeah. an interesting one. So, so for me, this has all been very much, and so my experience with all is actually taking me away from religion, or, or, or certainly spirituality in the way it's traditionally thought of, and, and given me much more connection and access with my own body, and I've learned to to trust and focus and orient myself in my body mm -hmm. and I'm less in need I suppose of any sense of being supported by something out there mm -hmm. so yeah. the experience for me has been a retreat if you like from yeah. spirituality for okay. yeah. and, and, but, and opening up in all kinds of wonderful ways and this retreat from any sense of a need for it, there being anything yeah. Yeah, beyond yeah. and so what so it sounds like it's been different for you yeah, well, I don't know if it's been different for me. Um, well, it's been different in the sense that I always had this spiritual perspective. I remember when I was 15, actually, I always say my life started when I was 15, because when I was 15, I discovered the work of Krishna Murti. And uh, I was too young to understand what he was really saying, but I could feel intuitively, I felt there's something really important here. And then I started uh, studying, when I studied psychology, I, I also studied Zen Buddhism and, you know, regular Buddhism and um, Confucianism and Taoism. So I was very much drawn towards Eastern spirituality. And at the same time, I was always 
wondering, you know, about psychology. What is this human being? What's making him tick? And I don't know what, uh, how this, this whole process actually has, to me, I mean, it's, it feels more like it's, um, it belongs to, to me, it's like, it's, uh, <laughs> it's difficult to put into words, but they belong together. I, my model of the human being is a model where you have like three rings and the outer ring is the body. Then the inner ring is the mental, emotional body. And then in the center, the, uh, the circle in the center is what I call the spirit. And I think the blocks and the defenses actually are in the mental, emotional, and uh, physical body. And working with these then helps you to access this other dimension in yourself. Because spirituality, to me, is not about something out there. It's not about some man on a cloud or... or some whatever somewhere no spirituality to me is is about my deepest uh, the deepest dimension in myself actually accessing that and that dimension is then connected to everything because it is not only in me it's also in you it's in the animals it's in the plants it's in everything that's around us so that process um you know, it's not about religion and it's not about something outside, but it's, for me, it's like, I, I yeah, I think it's the most important, um, it's the most important, the, it's, to me, it's like the ultimate reality. It's like, I think that the mental, emotional, physical body, in a way, are illusions also. I mean, we have the defenses, which I call illusions, but then I think the whole world that we perceive through our senses in a way is also an illusion and that there is another dimension there is another reality actually behind that but this um, this is beyond the scope of PRI PRI is, is, is in my eyes is just a method that could if you want if you want if you don't then it's fine too but if you want it's a method that can help you actually maybe more easily access that other dimension but this is very personal you know this is i don't know it's always been inside of me it's it's always been uh, and i come from an atheist uh, upbringing maybe because i come from an atheist upbringing i was free you know to explore everything i was not i was not conditioned to believe anything or not to believe anything i had no likes or dislikes yeah but, okay, that, 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 there's a Rumi quote that comes to mind, and I'm going to get it wrong, but it's something like break apart your stony self and, and come to the treasury of non-existence, or the mm-hmm. you know, idea that we break the self and become, yeah. exactly. and find yeah. ourselves in this non-existence. Yes, yeah, yeah. And Rumi is, is, is yeah, he's someone who very much inspires me and very much talks to my heart, you know, it's a, The image actually that I always have is that the heart is like the gate to the spirit or to the soul. And the soul is nothing else than this, the totality of everything, the collective, you know, the the super consciousness that's in everything. So the heart is the gate to that. So you need to open the heart in order to pass through it to get to that level. And how do you open the heart? That's by letting the pain out because the old pain is you know stored everywhere in the body but it's also very much stored in the heart and it's the defenses around the heart that actually keep the pain inside so it's you know like metaphorically speaking but sometimes it's it's also literally the way people can feel it like the hardening of the heart which makes us hard which makes us unconscious which, which makes us you know, do things to each other that are not so nice and do things to ourselves that are not so nice, not living from compassion and empathy and connection. But that's the defensive living. And then if you get away these defenses, you start tearing down these defenses, then you come to the level underneath, which is the pain. Then the pain comes out. And if you can let that happen, then the heart can really start to open up and you can really start to, you know, connect connect to yourself, connect to others from empathy, from compassion. And then for me, then there is this, this next, uh, I don't know what to call it, level, dimension, way of being. Yeah. 
But so, hey, you know, life is a life is a journey. It's an adventure, and I think everybody is doing their own discoveries huh, on that on that trip. Yeah. Okay. So, how do people like they hear us and they're like, "Oh God, you know, they're talking about going back to their birth, what the hell, and yeah. and, and, and breaking apart this the illusion of self to find some yeah. higher dimension." Like for some people, that's going to go way over their mm-hmm. their heads, right? So, what's What's something people can do practically that that just kind of step steps yeah. them on this journey? Like, yeah, I think the I think the most important thing to do is to start observing yourself on a daily basis. You know, just from moment to moment, and start to to see if you can find moments in which your emotional reaction seems out of place. So that all of a sudden you become irritated, or all of a sudden you become fearful or you start doubting yourself or you start really becoming stressed or you start feeling a a strong need to numb yourself with a drink or a cigarette or whatever you know start start watching for those moments because here these are the five defenses that i just named so start watching for these emotional shifts that it's like a sudden shift in how you feel like everything was fine and all of a sudden something happened and that's the the moment in which you have perceived something in the present which actually has a exact resemblance to something that you needed to repress and deny when you were were a very small child and that then activates one of the five defenses so i think this is very interesting because then you can start to see which things uh, in is, Put it differently which things trigger me but it's really on a daily basis and they can be very small things like how do you react when you're in a traffic jam you know some people they just can't stand waiting in line they just it, it just upsets them so much that they go away being in, stuck in a traffic jam or how is it if someone in traffic just you know like cuts right in front of you for example or how is it when uh, at your work you have the idea that your colleagues uh, don't say hello in the morning and they look the other way? Or when they're having a good time together and they don't seem to notice you? I mean, it's all these little situations which can provoke um, these sudden changes in uh, our feeling state. And that's very interesting to start uh, observing yourself there and then to feel, hey, you know, what, what's going on? How how does this actually make me feel? What or what is it bringing up? It doesn't really make us feel anything. It's bringing up something from the past. So it's good to know that we all have these defenses and they are active all day. So it's not so hard if you really start observing yourself. Well, you're going to find them, and then to know that behind these defenses actually is something. Something is going on. Something that happened to you when you were very small. And I think that could be like the first steps on on this road of discovery. And of course, you know, then I would say if you if you feel like, hey, this sounds interesting, I think you need to go and read some books. And of course, I would, you know, propose uh, to read the, the my my fourth book is the easiest one. It's called it's always a long title in English: Past Reality Integration. Mastering the Three Steps to Conscious Living. It's a very long title they gave it in, in English. Um, but that's a small book. It's an easy uh, book to read, and it's full of practical exercises that explains, you know, what I, what I just briefly touched upon and makes it all uh, much more, brings it down to earth and practical, and you can apply it immediately. Yeah. And you have specific techniques for journaling, don't you? And that, and yeah, to how to make these notes and, and yes. So the first thing is you, you, know, you watch the whole day. You you watch, try to watch for defenses. So is, do I recognize one of the five defenses? So then you write down the defense, and then you the next step you is to ask yourself, okay, so what activated this defense? What happened just before I got uh, afraid? For example, if the fear defense was activated. What was it? What what happened just before? And oh yeah, it was you know the the look on my husband's face. You know the the certain look that sometimes he can have. Okay, so that happened just before I started feeling anxious. So that's then the next step. That's the symbol. And then the next step is to ask yourself, okay, so what exactly 
does this communicate? What do I feel that he's saying to me? Now, this is a little bit difficult and this needs a little training, but it's like there's a hidden message in what we perceive. So in this case, it's the, the certain look on your partner's face. So there is a hidden message, and that's the reason why it activates the fear in this case, this example of the fear defense. So the hidden message, which you are perceiving unconsciously, <laughs> is, for example, I'm really angry at you, and, you know, I'm going to give it to you later. There's something like that. You know, it could be very, it could be a threat, like, you know, I'm going to get you. And now, of course, that message is probably not coming from your partner in the present, but is a direct reflection of what you experienced as a small child. And your father or your mother who did this to you then would have a certain look on his or her face, which then your subconscious is perceiving in your partner's face in the present. Whereas your partner in the present might just be, you know, tired from work or, you know, worried about something, upset about something. It could be completely different, but our subconscious mind is going to make the click because the look is the same look as it was then, and we are programmed to think, if I see that look, then the other person is going to come out and get me. That's the and imprint. He, right? That's the, exactly, that's the imprint. And then the fear defense will be activated, so I want to get out of there, and I want to save myself. Yeah. I can remember when I was doing my early work with Primal, uh, one, of the, I t one of the moments I took into the, the, the session was, I'd got some some clothes washed at the washed at the laundry, and the mm. way the guy in the laundry looked at me giving his change, <laughs> giving me the change, had mm. triggered a feeling in me, and yeah, and that took me all the way back to childhood exactly. and then birth. Exactly. It's extraordinary isn't it, how it works. It's incredible, and it makes me think of an example which is just astonishing. I had a client who had done a lot of therapy already, but then he came. He came to me and we worked. It was only the third session and he came into my office and the gardener was working outside and the gardener didn't look at him or something. I mean, yeah, he didn't or he looked and he looked away. And this look was enough to help this client to access actually how he had been abused by his grandfather, something that he had never understood, which then in his present life had led to many fears of, you know, in all kinds of social situations, he was very afraid because the grandfather lived with them. The mother knew what was going on. Nobody protected him. It was horrible, horrible, horrible thing. But imagine, it was just, you know, from something that uh, you wouldn't think anything of it. Hmm. Yeah, these tiny perturbations can... Yeah. trigger or uh, symbolic yeah. of the yeah, yeah. so to, to start I think this, that could be an interesting starting point is just observe yourself for when things you know in life have a strong uh, cause a strong reaction in you there something is going on there mm. the other thing that I found was um, just, just starting to name feelings like complete the sentence I feel X or I felt X and I, I did a lot of work uh, in groups before I hit any of this therapy where I just practiced some of that and mm. that I can see now really helped actually mm. some preparation mm. for this because I didn't, you know, yes. I didn't have that articulation. No, for a lot of people just, you know, knowing what they feel is really hard. They live in their heads and they feel, what do you mean feel? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, it's, that's really important. That's that's very that's good that you say that. First step is to, to know what you're feeling and to be able to feel your body because feelings are in the body. And a lot of people don't really feel much. They don't feel uh, their body very much. So then it's very hard to do this work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that's sometimes I'll notice it now. I'll ask somebody how they feel, and they'll use thinking words. So I'll say, "Hey, mm -hmm. how do you feel?" And they're like, "Well, I'm." I think that, uh, yeah, this, this guy's a bit of an idiot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but what do you feel? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. The difference between, exactly, yeah. A judgment and a feeling, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. That's that's those are really important things to learn. Yeah, so that, that's a good starting point also huh, if you want to do this sort of work. Yeah. yeah. And your defenses test, I mean that's I mean, it may not be the place to, t- to start, but it, it, for me, it helped. So you've got a server. Maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. What 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 is your yeah. defenses test? Yeah, I think that's uh, yeah, that's for a lot of people. You know, they they like filling out tests, and uh, so I made a test um, in which there is fifty questions, ten questions per defense, or five defenses. So that makes fifty questions in total. Um, in which you, you know, just answer with a figure from the, it really applies to me or doesn't apply to me. And then you, you get an idea of your defense profile because we all, everybody uses all five defenses, but the, the degree to which we use each defense does differ from person to person. So some people, you know, are much more into false power. You could say they, they get angry a lot. They, they, they are judgmental. They feel victimized, you know, like, you know, you know, some people have a preference, <laughs> subconscious. I mean, it's not a choice, of course, but they're easily into that defense, whereas others might be suffering from fear, a lot of fear or false hope, whatever. So so when you do this test, you can get an idea of how your defense structure actually, uh, how it looks. And then as you do the work, your defense structure is going to change because in general, you see that people who have not yet really done this sort of work on themselves, they will have more of the higher defenses. And the higher defenses, higher in the wall, are denial of needs and false hope and false power. And as your process is on its way, you will start to you know, go down into the wall of defenses and have more and more primary defense and more and more fear because the way out of the defenses is down. It's not up. You, there's no... There's no door in the highest level. You can only, uh, sorry, there's a thing on my computer. You can only get out of the defenses by going down into the pain. So defense tests can be interesting to see, you know, how strong are my defenses and which defenses do I use most. It's, a, it's an interesting sort of like self-test. We'll put a link to it in the in the notes for the show, and I've I've used it as a way to to plot my progress over the years. Mm. My big ones was right from the start: false hope. I mean, I've yeah. definitely active in the other defences, and I've I've seen that that go go down mm. you know, with, uh, with more more therapy over time. Yeah. One thing that piqued my interest in your latest book, Illusions, was where you plotted out what we now understand about consciousness. My latest book was uh, on relationships, huh? Sorry, okay. So in your book, Illusions, yeah. um, your, um, the way you plot out consciousness and, and when we become conscious of our thoughts, and could you explain that a bit for people? Because I, I found it fascinating and, and how it relates to this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. So, so when, the, when the thought emerges, when we become conscious of it, and then this idea of us being able to veto. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, the, the, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's really interesting that there seems to be like an, an automatic reaction coming up, you can say generated subconsciously, and it will lead to some sort of reaction. But they have found that actually there is a very small moment in time in which we do become aware of this impulse, and we do have have a veto right or veto possibility. So we can actually, in that very small amount of time, we can say, you know, it's just more, it's just a few seconds or not even, we can actually, because we are aware of what's happening, we can say, no, I don't want to do this. Now, and then stop the, the reaction. Like, for example, if you're addicted, say to cigarettes, something I was very addicted to for a long time. You know, if you could just feel the urges coming up, and then it's like automatic, you reach out and you grab the cigarette and you light the cigarette and you think, yeah, well, you know, that's just how it is. But there is a, <laughs> there is a moment in which you can actually say, no, stop. Now, of course, with the smoking, you are aware that you're going to do it. But it's with many things that we do, like these defenses, they are unconsciously, subconsciously generated. And like you will burst out in anger, for example. There is a moment in which you can actually become aware of what you're doing and you can stop it. 
that is possible. So that's very hopeful because, you know, many people feel as if they don't have much influence on many things, that there they are habits and that's just the, the way I am and it's just the way how it is in my family and my mother was also depressed and my father was also angry and my blah, 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 blah. But it's not true. We can become aware of these subconsciously generated impulses and then stop them. That's a really powerful message because how often when I bring this conversation up do I hear, well, that's just who I am. That's my personality. You know, It's in my genes, right? Yes. I hear that one a lot. It's not true. It's, it's really not true. And it's so hopeful because it gives, you know, so much, there's so much space and for development. To change, actually, to change your life into the way you want it to be, instead of the way it turns out to be because of your defenses. For those out there who are listening to this thing, well, there's no way I'm going to do any of this, right? I'm not going to do any journaling. I'm not going to do any therapy. Is there any way people can use this knowledge, even if the the, the moment in their lives not willing, able to to do the yeah. work? I think just realizing that that we are all, um, you know, carrying this old pain from early stressful experiences that have to be repressed. First of all, to understand that this is a, you know, this goes for everybody, no matter how happy your childhood was. And then to know that we are all reacting from these five defenses on a daily basis. I mean, that is really you know, so so good to know. So then you can become much more, you can be more mild and have more compassion for yourself and others. For example, you see someone getting angry and you understand that something that he's been perceiving is actually, he's perceiving his past. Right? It's like the metaphor that I use in the TED Talk that I gave. Like we're all wearing glasses and actually we think we're looking at the present, but what we're seeing is, is just a direct reflection from our past. But because we are seeing our past, we are reacting to the present as if it was the past. So my neighbor, for example, who doesn't say hello in the morning, then I think, oh, he wants to let me know that he doesn't like me. So then I will become very unfriendly with him. So that's an example of how, you know, we, we are being influenced all the time by, by our past for as far as we have not been able to heal it, integrate it, process it. So I think knowing that can can also be very helpful to have more compassion for yourself, you know, not to judge yourself or others so harshly, to know that these defensive reactions are active most of the time in most people, that they are generated from pain, painful early uh, experiences, and to know that instead of perceiving the present, we are actually perceiving um our painful past without knowing it and that we can do something about it. I think just knowing that might, you know, help some people to feel less uh, guilty, to feel less bad about themselves or about others and to know, you know, also it's, it's hopeful. You can do something. You can do a lot actually about it. If you, if you, you know, take this, I would just say, take a step, you know, give this, it's the biggest present you can give yourself. I mean, I can't see what bigger present in life there is than to help, you know, allow yourself to free yourself from all this unnecessary luggage, which is making the journey in life very, very, uh, very much more difficult than it would have to be. Yeah. But of course, you know, everybody has their own timing and their own feeling and it's not the right time for everybody all the time. You yeah. got to feel the moment that, that it feels, okay, now I want to do this. But I really don't think there's anything, I, I can't imagine anything um, that would be, you know, prohibiting people or, or keeping you from doing this. I don't... <laughs> I think it's out there. Go and get it, you know? <laughs> I, mean, I, I found that, and Jeff did talk about this, and maybe that's the difference between the process you're describing and one of I've experienced in terms of regression is that it's very hard to, so for some people, and certainly this was the case for me, it was hard for me to continue full-time work. Yes. Because I was spending, you know, days on yeah. the bed crying, right? And it's hard to, you know, get up and yeah. do a job. So, yeah. so that was certainly a reality for me in terms of where other people are thinking about Budging in this direction is yeah what's your take on that in terms of the I think that's really uh, that's really a big difference yeah 
my my friend arrives. <laughs> so you had... God, we're at ninety minutes. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. So we, j'ai presque fini. So I I think this is a big difference with PRI uh, and and what your experience is because that's really um, we will go into. Uh, deep regressions but they will not last for days not even for hours they will last maybe 10 minutes 15 minutes and then you come back into the present and then we really help people to connect to the present so the fear that you cannot function anymore is really um, it's, it doesn't really apply in PRI no and for people PRI that's past reality integration which is important. yes Exactly, and yeah. maybe that's a good place to to end for people. Then, so just where's the, we've talked, we've we've obviously we've mentioned some of your books and so on. In terms of past reality integration, which is your your body of work, your organisation, where's the best mm-hmm. sort of place to start learning a bit more about that? Yeah, I, I think the easiest way uh, would be to start reading a book, mm-hmm. and the easiest book to start with is past reality integration: the three steps to uh, mastering your no, 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 no. Uh, okay. Or of course, you know, go to the go to the website pastrealityintegration.com and um, you can do the defense test. You can you know choose there if you want to you know immediately start therapy. You can find a therapist on the website. Um, you can read up about uh, PRI on the website. Uh, there's also an online course that I just recently uh, made that people can start doing if they would like to do that. If they, you know, if they feel like, okay, I'd like to read a book, but I don't want to go into therapy, but I do want to do more than read a book, then there is an online course in which um, I teach you to do the basic skills. So that's another possibility. So I think, yeah, there's coaching, there's uh, intensive therapy, then there's a training program for therapists that would like to, you know, uh, professionally start applying this this method. Great. So there's a whole bunch of stuff, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I can say that whilst I haven't done PRA and I haven't been through your process, the, the, the principle of taking this regression type approach for a lot of the audience who I expect to be people working in businesses and maybe not within the therapy community, this has helped me enormously as a professional, as a management consultant, um, as somebody working with clients. So check it out. Yeah, <laughs> this is, <laughs> as you say, the gift to yourself. Yeah. And if you feel like the time is right for you now, then yeah, go check it out. Yeah. There's nothing, to, there's so much to win and there really isn't anything to lose. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. Your friend has arrived. Yes. I won't keep you from your, your your next engagement. Thanks so much for your time. We'll put all of the links in the in the in the description for the show. And yeah. Yeah, have a great uh, great evening. Thank you. Okay, Richard. It was great talking to you.